The term SPSS stands for Statistical Package for the Social Sciences. This is a software that we use to analyze data. So SPSS has the capability of analyzing data using some basic statistics and all the way to advanced statistics. For example, you can use SPSS to calculate things like averages or to do frequencies, but you can also use it to do charts and also other advanced statistics, for example, chi-squares, correlations, mean comparisons, regressions, and even structural equation modeling. And the reason why SPSS is extremely popular is because it actually uses a very simple and straightforward user interface instead of just a language that might actually be difficult for other people to start using it. So as you can see here on my screen, you can actually use SPSS through the interface itself by just clicking on the menus and selecting what kind of analysis you'd like to do. So as you can see here, with just a few clicks, I should be able to actually run an output as you can see right here. So in this course, I'm going to take you from the very basics of using SPSS, from how do you even enter data, up to how you actually analyze the data. But in the end, the most important thing that I will be sharing in this course is how you can actually interpret the output that you get from SPSS. So let's get started with how do you get to install SPSS. In this lesson, I want to show you how you can download a copy of the trial version of SPSS. It actually allows you to use SPSS for free for 30 days. And we're going to be using that for practicing with uh, the analysis that we're going to be doing in this course. So I'm going to go ahead and um, right here, I'm actually in Google Chrome. So I'm just going to say SPSS trial and press enter. And you can see that we have this first page here that says IBM SPSS trials. And I'm gonna open that. And here we go. We are on the IBM website and we are on the SPSS trials page. So here I can just go ahead and say, try SPSS statistics for free. And now it's asking me to create an IBM account. If you already have an IBM account, then you can just go ahead and click login or if you don't have an IBM account, then it means you have to go ahead and specify some account information. Now, I do already have my IBM account, so I'm just gonna go ahead and click login. But if you don't have, just fill in the information here, your email, your first name, last name, your password, and go next, you'll provide some additional information, then verify your email, and you're gonna have your own IBM account that can be used for so many other things in IBM. But once again, I already have an IBM account. So I'll just click login. And right here, it actually recognizes that this is me. I'm just gonna go ahead and continue here. And now it's asking me if I agree to be contacted by IBM for special student pricing. Well, I think that's fine. Let's find out how that goes. So I'm just gonna say yes, I'll click continue. And now you can see that I do have IBM SPSS statistic subscription trial. And here I can actually click to download. So just go ahead and click download. And here I'm on the downloads page. It's basically giving me information about the trial. So the trial has all the features in Nabot and including add-on features. That's awesome. Okay, I have to download and install the application on my computer. If I have any issues, I can go to the troubleshooting page by clicking this. And after installation, I'll have to use the IBM ID. So the account that I have with IBM that's the one that I'm going to use to turn on my subscription and actually start using SPSS. So I can just go ahead and scroll down and you can see that now we have all these options. So the first option is a 64 bit software. And based on my computer, this is the one I should be choosing. If you have a computer that is quite recent, there's high probability this is the one that you should supposed to be choosing. But if your computer is running a 32-bit version of Windows, then you might want to use this one. But there's very high probability that you have a 64-bit operating system, so you have to use this one. If you're running on Mac OS, then you have the option here at the end to download SPSS. I'm just gonna go ahead and click the download button here for Microsoft Windows 64-bit. So now, here it is. I'm just gonna go ahead and download this. And now we just have to wait for it to finish downloading. And then we're gonna come back with how to install. 
So we have our copy of SPSS statistics downloaded here. So I can just go ahead and click here. Now your operating system might actually ask you if you wanna allow this to make changes on your device. This is perfectly fine. We downloaded it from the IBM website. We can trust it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click yes. And now the install shield wizard is preparing your IBM SPS statistics setup. And here all we have to do is click next. Here we have the license agreement. We must accept the license agreement and click next. And he's just telling us where this program is gonna be installed. The default is fine. You click next and then you click install. And now we're just gonna wait a bit until it finishes installing. And now IBM SPSS statistics has installed and here it says start IBM SPSS statistics now. So if I click finish, it's going to start. I think that's fine. Let's click that, finish. And now we are presented with a screen where we have to log in with our IBM ID. To do this, obviously you need to have an internet connection. So it means every time I'm starting up my SPSS software, I have to be online. For the sake of practice, that's fine. I'm just gonna go ahead and click login with IBM ID. And now I have to specify my, the login details for my IBM account. Remember, it's the same IBM account we just created. And those are my details, I click login. And of course, certain times you have this Windows alert, which is fine with me. I actually even check the private networks and click allow access and I actually do have SPSS opened as you can see right now. So this window is the start window of SPSS and we're gonna start talking about this window and the rest of the windows in the next section where we'll be getting started by looking at the SPSS interface. But at this point, bravo and congratulations, you now have the latest version of SPSS and you have your trial that has started in the next set of days, obviously this trial is going to expire. So make sure that you make the best use of the software as you are in the trial and make sure that within the time that you are using the trial, you are able to complete the course. In this lesson, we'll be talking about the SPSS interface. If you have been using SPSS before, from version 15 all the way to the latest version that I'm using as of this recording, which is this version we've just installed, SPSS version 28, the interface is not very different, especially when it comes to the functionality that we are provided on the interface. There might be a little few changes on the graphics that they're using, but really behind all of it, it's almost the same. So the first thing that you can see here is that we have this start window and says, welcome to IBM SPSS. And it's allowing you to just click a button to create a new data set or maybe to create a database query if you have a database where you want to capture information from. And it's basically telling you what's new in this version and some links to the help and support tutorials and community. And you can also switch here to look at recent files and also look at sample files. I think this is really important here. You can actually just take a look at the sample files and use them in your analysis. If you don't want to have this every time you're starting your SPSS software, then you can just go ahead and click don't show this dialog in the future. But you can agree with me that there are certain things here that may actually be important. So instead of don't show this dialog in the future, I'm just gonna close this window. Now, when you do that, you notice that behind that, we actually have another window. And this is the IBM SPSS statistics data editor. I always like to make sure that I have expanded this to fill in the whole space. I think that looks much better. Okay, so let's go through the interface. The first thing at the top is basically the name of the software and the name of the window. So SPSS actually does have multiple windows. One of them is the one we just closed, which is the welcome or the start window. But this is the data editor window. So the data editor window is the main window in SPSS. That's where you actually see the data itself and the variables for that data. Then the next line is actually the menu. And you have so many different menu items like file. So under this, you have all this information that has to do with the file that you have opened. For example, creating a new file, opening a file, importing data. We're going to see how to import data here, especially importing Excel files. 
or you want to open a restore point or you want to save all data, you want to export this to, for example, Excel and other formats as well. Now, you also have the edit menu, which has to do with copying, undoing, redoing, cutting, pasting, and so on. Then we have the other one, which has to do with just the view or how the window is looking like right now on your screen. And you can see that we have, for example, we can check to remove the status bar, which is the bar at the end there. And you want to edit the menu itself and so on. Okay. The next is the data menu item. This is a menu item where you are going to find a lot of functionalities that have to do with editing your data itself. So for example, you want to identify unusual cases or maybe you want to identify duplicate cases, you want to transpose, split files, select cases. We're going to see some of these in later lessons, especially on the topic of data management. And we also have the transform menu here where you find commands that have to do with editing your variables. So that is transforming your variables. For example, maybe you want to create a new variable or you want to change a variable into a different variable or you want to rank cases. And so many of the functionalities that you have here will create new variables or they are going to replace the values that you have in an existing variable. We're going to go deeper into this and actually see when you can actually use this. Then you have the powerhouse itself, which is analyze tab. And you can see all the analysis that you have here. You have reports, descriptive statistics. You even have Bayesian statistics. You have tables, compare means, and so on. This is where we come when we want to actually do data analysis in SPSS. I'm going to talk about that. You have graphs where you have the chart builder. We're going to take a look at the chart builder in the section of developing charts. And then you also have other utilities. For example, if you want to define a macro, which is a piece of program that automates a few things that you want to be doing in SPSS. And maybe you want to add extensions. And then in the end, you have here the window. So basically, if you have several windows, you can split the windows and so on, or you can minimize windows. It's basically the same as just clicking minimize here at the top. And then lastly, you have the help menu item where you can actually go to topics and learn how to do analysis in SPSS. The documentation is actually extremely good. And I actually very much recommend that while you're learning, you also take a look at the topics here or you go to SPSS forums and or you go to SPSS statistics community or to download the documentation in PDF format for you to actually read and continue learning. Now, below the menu itself, you now have the toolbar. So the toolbar is basically just a list of functions that are commonly used. So the functions that you have here are also in the menus. So for example, the first icon here is for opening a new data document. And this one is for saving, this one is for printing and so on. So, so all the icons that you have here, you also do have them in the menu, but just because they're used often, you're going to find it actually very convenient if you actually just use them through this toolbar instead of having to go through the menu where you have to click several times. Now, the next is basically this bar here, which actually shows you the contents of the cells that you have opened so far. So right now, we don't have any information on the cells that we have here on this screen that looks like a worksheet. Uh, but if you have information here, when you click, you're going to see the information, all of the information in that cell within this box right here. And below that is where we have the main program now. So the SPSS data editor window is actually divided into two views. The view that you're looking at right now is called the data view. And this is where you're actually going to see the actual data itself. So in the data view, the rows actually stand for the individual records in your data. So for example, if you're collecting information about children's nutrition, so each of these rows might actually be a specific record or a specific child that you're collecting the data from. Or if it's about households, then each of these row is actually going to stand for a single household. So one single unit of your data is what this row is about. So in SPSS is called a case, but you might actually just call it a record of data. 
The columns are variables. As you can see, the shortening here, it says VAR. That's just standing for variable. Right now, we don't have any variable yet, but once we create the variables in the variable view, then the name of the variable is actually going to appear in the columns there. Let's switch to the variable view. You can switch to go to the variable view by clicking down below here. Just click variable view, and you can actually see it actually looks very similar here. It also looks like a worksheet where you have columns and rows. But this time, because we are in the variable view, the columns are the characteristics of each of the variable. So we have the characteristic of the variable name, the variable type, the variable width, the variable decimal, and so on. So each variable is going to have this information. The rows are now the individual variables themselves. So now if you have, let's say you have a variable age, you're going to specify the name, the type, the width, the decimal, all of the information here up to the end. So we're going to go through all of this when we're talking about creating variables and entering your data in SPSS. So with that, I hope you're ready to get started. But in the next section, we're going to take a break from SPSS a bit to actually start talking about some basics of statistics that you need to understand. I'm going to make them so easy for you, and we're going to need those things when we're starting to talk about how to enter data, how to define your variables, and how to analyze your data. So let's go into the next section. Before we dive in into the statistics, let's first of all find out about data. As human beings, we're very inquisitive. In most cases, we ask a lot of questions. For example, maybe with the COVID situation, you might have noticed that there's a lot of dropouts in schools. So you were inquisitive, you want to find out what are the effects of COVID on education outcomes for kids? Now, for you to be able to answer that question, you need to go out and actually collect facts. You cannot just sit down and guess through the problem. This is where science comes in. We want to go out and collect some facts. So the individual pieces of facts that we collect for the sake of analyzing it, that's what we call data. We go out, so for example, in this case, I would go out and ask people or ask students to find out what has been the effect of COVID on the education. So I might have to ask certain questions. So those kind of questions that I'm asking on the students are what we are calling data. So this is going to come in terms of certain values. So for example, I might be interested to know the gender of the students. I might be interested to know the ages, the classrooms that they're in maybe the income levels and so on. I want to find out if they have had someone in their family who had COVID. So what happened after that? So those pieces of information that we're collecting, those pieces of facts that we're getting from our respondents, that's what we're calling data. So whether you call it data or you call it data, well, it's all the same. You're actually going to hear me say that interchangeably. So data actually comes in different formats or different types. So let's take a look at the different types of data that you're gonna come across. So the first type of data is qualitative data. And this is basically data in form of words. So if you ask a question, for example, gender, the responses that you're gonna get, the values that you're going to get are going to be in the form of words. For example, male, or female. If I ask you, are you married? You're going to answer in, in the form of words as well, whether you're married or you're single, or maybe you are divorced. So qualitative data comes in a way of words. But not only that, we usually don't have any specific or objective tool that we can use to measure the values. So for example, if you're asking, are you married or not? We don't necessarily have a measurement. We don't have a tool that we are using to actually objectively measure whether this person is married or not. Or if I ask you what's your level of satisfaction of this course, then the response that you're gonna give me could be in numbers or could be in words, but I don't necessarily have a, an objective way in which I can measure that. I don't have a scale somewhere, a tool that I can use to actually measure the level of your satisfaction. So that is qualitative data. So in qualitative data, we're mostly not describing things in terms of quantities. We simply have maybe groups of things. Uh, we're just mentioning names of things. So those names or groups of things, or maybe levels of things, that's what qualitative data is about. So let's take a look at the second type of 
data. Second type of data is actually quantitative data. And from the word itself, you can actually see quantitative, we're talking about quantities, right? So quantitative data describes quantities expressed numerically. So for example, if I ask you how old you are, you're gonna give me your age in terms of numbers. So you're gonna tell me that you're probably 20 years of age or 30 years of age. So that 30 there is a quantity of time. But it can also be, for example, what's the distance from your home to your nearest borehole? Or how many people are in the same room that you're watching this lesson? So because you're gonna give me in terms of numbers and these numbers are objectively defined, for example, if you're talking about age, somebody who's 20 years old in one country is 20 years old in another country. And the reason for that is because we have an objective way of measuring time. But also if you say how many people are in the room, you're gonna actually count the number of people. So we have an objective way of measuring that. So that's quantitative data and the values come in terms of numbers. Now let's take a look at how data is collected. We now know that we have qualitative data and we have quantitative data and that for us to answer questions about the world around us, we have to collect facts that we're calling data. But how are we going to collect this data? So there are two main ways in which data is collected. So we have what you call primary data. So primary data, this is data collected for the first time by an investigator for a specific purpose. So if I go in the field or if I go to some respondents, some households, or let's say I meet some students and I'm asking them questions firsthand, then that is primary data. Or maybe you're getting your data from some experiment that you're doing. Because this is a fresh experiment that you're conducting. You're actually getting the data from the source itself that is from the respondents or from the occurrences that are happening in real time. And that is what we call uh, primary data. So this is data that doesn't have any statistical operations done on them. This is not summarized data. The data is raw. You just collected it from respondents, for example, that is what we call primary data. Now, we also have secondary data. So secondary data is data sourced from somewhere. So for example, if you go to your country's statistical office, they actually collect some data, but now let's say that they have analyzed that data, then that becomes secondary data. And you are getting information, you're getting facts, from someone who has already summarized that information. We actually deal with a lot of secondary data from a daily basis. Maybe you're reading a newspaper article that is summarizing certain uh, figures and facts, and you're using that in your reporting, or you're getting that and actually doing your own extra analysis. So that's what we call secondary data. So that's it about data. In the next lesson, let's take a look at what we call variables. So in the previous lesson, we've talked about data and we found that data are pieces of facts that we collect for analysis. Now, these pieces of facts are going to come in the form of variables. So in this lesson, let's talk about the concept of variables. So what are variables? So variables are attributes that we are trying to study. So for example, let's say that we give a questionnaire or a data collection form to a number of students we might want to ask them questions like, what's your gender, or what's your sex, or what's your age, or what's your monthly income, and so on. So those individual points that we are trying to collect are what we're calling variables. And variables are sometimes known as data items. So now let's talk about different kinds of variables. So variables are categorized in terms of the data that they contain. Remember that when you go, for example, to a respondent, for example, to a student, and we're trying to capture data from them, these data are coming in different variables, or they're coming in different items or characteristics that we're trying to collect from these individuals. So the data that is contained within a specific variable determines what type of variable it is. So in this regard, we actually have quantitative variables. So just like we have quantitative data, we have quantitative variables. So quantitative variables are simply variables that contain quantitative data. So an example there is going to be age. So if you're asking how old are you, and you are expecting the responses to come in the form of numbers or in the form of a number of years, 
then that is called a quantitative variable. On the other hand, we have qualitative variables. So these are variables or data items or the questions or characteristics that we are trying to collect on our survey or whatever data collection that we're doing that contain qualitative data. We have already talked about qualitative data and given examples such as sex or marital status or race or color. So those data items whose values are going to be qualitative in nature, then those are qualitative variables. Okay, so let's take a look at these variables in greater depth. So for example, quantitative variables, we actually also have different types of quantitative variables. So the first one is what we call discrete variables. So discrete variables, these are variables where the values are quantitative or they're numeric, they're numbers, but the numbers themselves are discrete or the number of themselves are counts of individual items. So for example, if we say number of people, then that is a discrete value because you can never have a middle ground between one and two. So you can never have 1.5 people. You have to count each and one of the items individually. So number of people, number of trees, that is a discrete variable. On the other hand, we have continuous quantitative variables. So these are measurements of continuous values. So for example, age, all right, or distance or volume. So these are examples of continuous variables. So these variables can contain values that are on a continuous scale. So for example, age, you can have someone who is 20.5 years old, or some, uh, let's say distance, we can actually say 2.5 kilometers. So we are not necessarily going to just count each of the values discreetly, but rather you can actually have values in between of whole numbers. In simple terms, in mathematical terms, discrete values are like integers. So while continuous variables can take other forms of numbers, not just integers. So maybe you can have decimals and so on. So qualitative variables, these are also known as categorical or grouping variable. The reason they're called categorical is because they mostly put people into categories. So for example, if we're saying marital status, we have people who are single and people who are married. So basically you have those two specific categories there, or we can also call them groups, right? If you have sex, you have people who are male and then people who are female. If you have race, you, you know the categories that we put people under in terms of race. So because we put people into categories in quantitative variables, in most cases, these are also known as categorical or grouping variables. Now the question could be, why is it important for us to understand the different types of variables? When we start to analyze data, you are going to realize that the type of analysis that you can perform on a variable actually depends on the structure of data in that variable. In other words, it depends on the type of variable that you're dealing with. There are certain analyses that are only applicable or they only work well with categorical or quantitative variables. And there are others that actually work well with continuous variables or quantitative variables. Uh, for example, if you're dealing with categories, right, you cannot do any mathematical calculation on categorical values. For example, you have gender, male and female. We cannot add them up. We cannot divide them up. So you can never do any mathematical manipulation on categorical or qualitative data. Well, on the other hand, for continuous variables, for variables that can take so many different values in a numerical scale, then you can actually do some mathematical calculation. And because in most cases for continuous variables, you have a lot of values, for example, age, you have so many different values in age, it's not appropriate to be counting each of the values that we have in the variable. While for categorical values, you only have a few values. For example, for sex, you only have male and female. You, it's very, very simple and straightforward to count that. If you have race, you only have a finite list of races. Or if you have colors that you are trying to collect, you may have just a group of colors. While if you go to, let's say you're talking about income, everyone is gonna have a different value. If you're collecting so many values or you're collecting data from so many points, like let's say 100 or 200, you might actually have 200 very different values. In that case, it's not appropriate for you to be counting each and every one of them, but rather you have to do some mathematical calculation. So this is why it's very important for you to understand all this. But before we go, let's take a look at 
also different kinds or different types of variables, but this time by the role that those variables are performing in your research. So depending on what the variable is doing in your research, you can have two different types of variables. You have independent variables. So independent variables, these are variables that we think are the ones that are affecting the outcome of another variable. So let's take an example of a scenario where we are trying to study what affects the amount of rain that we get in an area. So you want to find out the factors that affect the amount of rainfall that we are going to receive. So those factors, for example, you might have wind, right? you might have temperature, you might have humidity. So those are variables that we think are affecting a certain outcome. In this case, the outcome is the volume or the amount of rainfall that we are going to receive. So those variables that we think are affecting amount of rainfall, those are independent variables. Actually, they are also called predictive variables. And I always like to call them predictive variables and independent. And the reason for that is um, when you say independent variable, it kind of sounds like they can never be affected. They are independent. They can never be affected. But that's not the fact because independent variables can actually even be affected by other variables. So the better way to call them is predictive variables so because we think that they are actually going to predict an outcome of a certain variable. In themselves, they could actually be affected by other variables as well. But at this point, we think they are predicting the outcome of certain values. That's why we're calling them predictor variables. Okay, so if you're structuring your research question or you're structuring whatever you're trying to find out, in the example that I've given you where we're talking about rainfall, what factors affect rainfall? So you're structuring that in terms of cause and effect, then what we're saying is the cause or whatever variable or whatever data item that you think is the one that is affecting the outcome of the other, that's the predictor. Now let's take a look at the other type. So the other type is a dependent variable. So this, if you have a cause, obviously you have an effect. So this is the effect. This is a variable that we think the values within this variable are going to change depending on what's going to happen with another variable. So the values, for example, the values of the amount of rainfall will change depending on the variables such as humidity, the temperature of the day, and so on. So the amount of rainfall is what we are studying, trying to see what would be the change in this variable and what variables are causing that change. And that's what we're calling dependent variables. We think that the values in the dependent variables are determined by the changes in the independent or the predictive variable. And we also call these as outcome variables. So when we come to the topic where we're going to be talking about cause and effect, for example, when we're doing regression analysis or analysis of variance, then we're going to be talking about predictor variables or outcome variables. Just think of them as independent variables and dependent variables. Or so in other words, cause on one hand and effect on the other hand. One of the most important things that we need to understand in statistics before we can even start to analyze data is measurement levels. So what are measurement levels? So measurement levels are actually the relationship between the values within a variable. Remember a variable is basically what's holding the information or the facts that we are trying to collect. So a variable can take multiple values or different possible responses. For example, if I ask, what's your sex? You could tell me whether you're male or female. If I ask you, are you married? You tell me whether you are single or you are married. So variables can take different values. Now, those different values, what is the relationship among those values? Now, obviously that's a book definition. Let's actually explain more about these measurement levels in a way that you understand very easily. But before you do that, it's actually extremely important to learn this because the choice of analysis that you're going to use actually depends on the type of variable, that is the measurement level of that variable. And it's very easy for us to understand at this point because we've already covered the types of variables like qualitative variables and quantitative variables. So the measurement of variables actually is a concept that is taken from types of variables. And we're gonna be tying in 
into types of variables when we're discussing measurement levels. So let's take a look at the different measures of variables or the different measurement levels of variables. Now, remember, we have already said that measurement levels actually come from the types of variables. And we know that we have qualitative variables and quantitative variables. So in qualitative variables, we actually have nominal variables. So nominal variable is actually a measurement level of variable. Apart from nominal variable, we also have ordinal variables and we have binary variables. So binary variables, ordinal variables, and nominal variables or our measurement levels under qualitative variable type. Then remember, we have quantitative variables. So quantitative variables can come in two measurement levels. You have ratio variables and you have interval variables. So let's take now dig deep inside of these different kinds of variables that we have talked about. But don't forget that we have quantitative variables then we have quantitative variables. Remember, qualitative variables are also known as categorical or grouping variables. And quantitative variables are also known as continuous variables. And so within the qualitative variable types, we have nominal, ordinal, and binary variables. While within the quantitative variables, you can, either, you can either have ratio variables or you can have interval variables. So let's start with nominal variables. So nominal variables are variables where the categories do not have a logical order okay so these are remember these are categorical variables or qualitative variables but the values themselves or the possible responses that you're going to get on a nominal variable do not have a logical order you cannot put them in a logical order of say quantity or anything else I'll give you an example of marital status you can define marital status in terms of whether the person is single or married or divorced now, these three categories that I've mentioned cannot be arranged in some logical order. So you cannot say that there's something more to single than in married or something more to divorced than in single. So these are simply names of values or names or of characteristics that you can give to people or how you can describe people. As a matter of fact, the phrase or the name nomino, the word nomino, is actually coming from the phrase name only. In other words, the categories or the values that we are describing, the values within this variable are just names of characteristics. They're just names that we are coining to certain attributes of the objects that we are trying to study. So examples of nominal variables can be sex, marital status, race, color, so every qualitative variable where the categories cannot be arranged in some order, we're calling that a nominal variable or name on them. So let's take a look at ordinal variables. So ordinal variables are variables where the categories have a logical order. So when you look at the values or the possible responses that you're going to get, you can actually arrange them in terms of a certain order. Okay. As a matter of fact, the word ordinal is actually coming from the word order. All right. So each category of, or possible value is actually a level of the variable. So I can give you, for example, satisfaction levels or level of education or level of agreement or maybe other continuous variables that we want. We just maybe decided to express them as categories. For example, there's people who actually collect age as age groups. So instead of actually asking how old are you and just recording the actual number itself, you're actually putting people into categories of age. So you can actually see, for example, if I give you an example of a level of education, let's say that you're collecting that as no education, and then you have primary school education, and you have secondary education or tertiary education. If you take a look at the categories here, you actually notice that these are in order. You actually notice that when you say primary education, we have more education in primary education as compared to no education. And if somebody actually went all the way to secondary school education, then you can actually say secondary education is actually more education than primary education. And also tertiary education, if, if somebody identifies as having, have, of having gone all the way to tertiary education, then they have done much more education than one who has just done secondary education or primary education. So the values in this variable are actually ordered. And you can actually say that each category 
is a higher level of the variable. So for another example, let's say you're talking about satisfaction and let's say that I ask you how satisfied are you with this course at this point and I give you the scale of 1 to 10. So someone who says that they are satisfied as a 9, that's obviously more satisfaction than someone who would say 6 or 5. So as you go up the categories, you're actually also going up in terms of the value itself. You're going up in terms of the quantity of some sort. But remember, these are still qualitative variables. These are still categorical variables. We're still putting people into categories, just that those categories can be ordered. So if you compare that with nominal variables, we're saying for nominal variables, the categories that we have cannot be ordered. All right, so let's now talk about binary variables. Now, binary variables are simply variables that have only two categories. So if you have a variable where you, the answer is yes or no, or on and off, or true or false, then that is called a binary variable, also called a dichotomous variable. Now let's move on to racial variables. Now, if you remember, we have now gone from qualitative variables, now we're talking about quantitative variables. First of all, racial variables are quantitative variables. So these are variables where you are actually collecting data that has been measured using an objective way or an objective tool for measuring. These are continuous variables that actually also do contain an absolute zero point or a meaningful zero point. Let's take an example of uh, number of people. Okay, so if you're saying there are zero people, you actually mean that there's no people. Uh, the zero there is actually meaningful and it actually stands for an absence of something. So that's what it means by absolute zero. And the values also have equality of intervals. All right, let's explain equality of intervals in a bit. All right, so let's say the difference between five and 10 people Right, so if you have five people, then 10 people, if you subtract that, so the difference is five. Let's move over on the scale. So if you have the difference between 20 and 25 people is also five people. So these two differences are the same, right? So if you are counting from a certain point to a certain point, if the difference is the same across uh, different numbers that you're trying to subtract, then that is equality of intervals. There are certain values where you don't have equality of intervals. I'll give an example for ordinal variables. So ordinal variables don't have equality of intervals. So if you say that your level of satisfaction may be, uh, you have numbers like you have one and three. So someone who says that they are satisfied as num at number three and someone who says they're satisfied at number two, if you subtract that, you have an interval of two. But is that the same satisfaction, that difference of two? Is it the same as the difference between maybe eight and 10, all right? So it might not be the same because the value there is very subjective. It's not, you don't have an objective way of measuring it. So an ordinal variable doesn't have equality of interval. While ratio variables, which are continuous or the quantitative, they do have equality of intervals. So I've given you an example, for example, number of people, that is actually a ratio variable. Now, on the other hand, we have interval variables. Again, these are quantitative variables, but the only difference with the ratio variables this time is that although you have equality of intervals, just like the ratio variables, the ratio between two numbers is not meaningful. What does that mean? Let's take an example of temperature. Okay, so if you're measuring temperature in degrees Celsius, right, if you say that today is 20 degrees, and maybe let's say two days later it's 40 degrees, you cannot necessarily say that it's twice the temperature that was two days prior. So 40 degrees is not twice the temperature as 20 degrees. And this is also very connected to something that we call the absolute zero. The thing about a variable like temperature is that you don't have an absolute zero. Let's explain this a bit. First of all, let's ask ourselves, what are we measuring when we are collecting data, say temperature? What are we trying to measure? So temperature is technically or scientifically is just the movement between atoms. 
So that is basically an equivalent of heat. So in essence, we are measuring the amount of heat that is in a certain object. That is what is called temperature. Now, if we say zero degrees Celsius, it does not necessarily mean that there is absence of heat. In fact, there are certain objects that at zero degrees, the atoms are actually moving. So zero there is not an absolute number. So as such, the variable temperature as measured in degrees Celsius is not a ratio variable, but rather it's an interval variable. It does have a quality of intervals, but however, it does not have an absolute zero. The zero there is not an absence of things and it's not meaningful. So I've given you an example of temperature, but another example that you can provide is pH. So pH is how we measure the acidity of objects. So when you say acidity is zero, that's not a meaningful zero. The zero there doesn't really have any meaning. It doesn't stand for absence of something. The pH of six is not twice the pH of three. As such, that is an interval variable. Now in SPSS, we are only going to see nominal variables, ordinal variables, and scale variables. So scale variables is just a bracket term for continuous variables or quantitative variables. So when we get to SPSS, you need to understand that for categorical variables, we have ordinal variables and nominal variables. While for continuous variables, we only have what you call scale variables, which is basically a bracket term for all continuous variables. So we're only gonna be dealing with three types of variables. But you need to understand that the two, nominal and ordinal, are categorical or qualitative variable, or a scale variable is basically a continuous variable or quantitative variables, which could either be ratio or they could be interval variables. So in this lesson, let's talk about branches of statistics. This is just going to be a little introduction about the branches of statistics, but once we start doing analysis, we are actually going to go in depth talking about the different statistics that are actually under this branch of statistics that I'm about to talk about. But I think, first of all, let's talk about what we call population and samples. Okay, let's take a scenario here. Let's say that you're trying to study the differences between using soft copy study materials and hard copy study materials on educational outcomes of students at your university, right? So now, the students in the university become the subjects that you're trying to study. So interested to find out the differences between using soft copy materials and hard copy materials, but for all the people in the university. But because of several reasons, for example, you may not have enough money to be able to study all those people, but also because it's gonna take a long time for you to actually study a lot of people, then you might not be able to actually study all those people. So let's say that you have 3,000 students in your university. So that is what we call a population. So the population is basically the number of people that you're actually trying to study. So these people actually in most cases have one specific attribute that is common across all of them. So in our case, these are actually students in a university. So the attribute is that they are all in that single university. Now, this is the population that we have. But like I've said, you might not be able to study all of this. That's why you're actually going to take a subset of those people. You're just gonna pick a few people and we call that your sample. So now, your sample is just a subset of that population that now you're going to try to study. So just take a look at the uh, definitions. A population is a complete group of people, objects or items, that you are trying to study. You wish that you could study all these people. In our case, all the 3,000 students in the university. But realistically, we are going to get what we call a sample. So a sample is now a smaller group of people or the objects that have been taken from that population that you are trying to study. So the population is gonna be big, a lot of people who share one attribute that you're interested in, but because of several reasons that I've mentioned earlier, for example, cost 
and time, you're only going to pick a few people from that population and that's what we call the sample. Statistics is extremely smart because it actually gives us the power to use a few people and study them and then in the end be able to generalize across that huge population. So the group that we are calling the sample are the ones that are actually going to participate in the study. So for example, you might actually come up with some questionnaires that these people are going to respond. So the people who are participating in the study itself, that is your sample. But like I've said in statistics, statistics gives us the power to actually use the sample or whatever we're getting from this sample to actually generalize to that broader population. So now let's go into the branches of statistics. The first branch of statistics is called descriptive statistics. And as the name suggests, descriptive, we're using descriptive statistics to describe or summarize your data. And which data are we talking about? The sample data. That is the data at hand. So descriptive statistics is only about summarizing the data that you have collected. It's not about now talking about the whole population. The goal of descriptive statistics is to just summarize and describe the data that you have at hand. So we do that using the mean, the median, the mode, and standard deviations, even charts. We're actually going to be looking at these in greater detail in just a moment. On the other hand, we have what we call inferential statistics. So inferential statistics now uses the data that we have collected from the sample in order to generalize or to make generalizations to the broader population that we are trying to study. Remember, we wish to study all the students in the university, but because of some reasons, we cannot. So we have drawn a sample. Now this sample is supposed to be representative enough. So there are ways in which we make sure that this is representative enough. Now, when the sample is representative enough, then we should be able to infer or to generalize whatever is going on in the sample to the broader population where the sample was taken. So that's what we are calling inferential statistics. And examples of inferential tests include correlations, t-tests, analysis of variance, and regressions. And again, we are going to look at this in greater detail in this course. And remember, our goal here is to be able to choose the correct type of analysis we have to do, and then to actually do that in SPSS, to be able to interpret what's going on within that analysis, and in the end, to actually write our analysis or interpretation using the APA format. Now, in this lesson, we want to get data into SPSS. So there are two ways in which you can get data into SPSS. You can manually create your variables and enter data, but you can also import data from other formats, for example, from Microsoft Excel. Now in this lesson, we're just going to see how we can manually create some variables and enter our data directly into SPSS. Suffice to say, it's not very recommended to enter data straight into SPSS, because there are other programs that are very specific to entering data and they actually do provide a lot of functionality about data entry. So I very much recommend using other programs, for example, Kobo Toolbox, whose course you can actually also find in the course platform. Okay, so now how do we create variables and enter data? We're gonna start by creating some variables. So remember here, to create variables, we need to switch to the variable view, which is this view here, by just clicking the button here at the bottom. Okay, so now we have a list of variables which I have provided along with this lesson. So make sure that you're looking at those variables as we are going to be doing this together. Okay, the first variable is case ID and the code is just Q1. So we're gonna start with the name of the variable. So the name of the variable is used in SPSS procedures and there are certain rules that you must follow when you are recording the name of the variable. So for example, it cannot contain any spaces. So here, if I type case ID like that with a space and press enter, it's actually going to say variable name contains illegal character. So we cannot do that, just click okay. The next rule is that you cannot start with a number. So for example, when if I say one case ID and press enter, Again, it says variable name contains an illegal first character. 
So the first character can only be a letter of the alphabet from A to Z. So that's okay, we'll just click okay there. But you can also not include any special characters, except some very few characters that are allowed. For example, the underscore, the at symbol, the hash symbol, or the dollar sign. If you include any other symbols, for example, the dot or the comma, it's also going to give you an error. It's always recommended to make sure that the name is short enough and it's also it's readable, but also the name of the variable should be unique. In other words, you can never have two variables that have exactly the same name. Okay, so remember, for our variables, we actually do have codes like Q1. So I think we're just gonna use Q1 there as the name of the variable. It passes all the rules that I've just mentioned. What I do in most cases once I have typed that is I press on my tab key on the keyboard to jump to the next. So when you jump to the next, you notice that SPSS actually adds some defaults. So we already have the type of variable, the width, the decimals, and so on. Of course, we're going to be changing some of these variable defaults, but for now, let's take a look at the next one. So the next is actually the data type. And the data type is basically the type of data that is going to be typed in in the data view. So when you go to the data view right now, so if I switch to data view, you notice that the variable comes here on the first column. So the data that is going to be entered here, is it going to be typed as numbers or is it as text? Let me switch back to variable view. So here, when you click on the word numeric, you see that there is a button on the right hand side here. When you click on the button, you're actually going to have this dialog box that has a list of so many different variable types. So the first variable type is numeric, and this is if the variable's values are going to be numbers. So this will include variables, for example, if you have household size or household income and so on. But in certain cases, we actually can also make a variable like gender, where you have words like male and female, to be a numeric variable. And the way we do that is that we will assign this as a numeric variable, and then we have to define the meaning of the numbers that we are going to assign. So for example, if we assign one for male and two for female, then we have to actually specify what one and two mean by using the column here that says values. So I'll talk about values in just a moment. So any variable that is purely numeric, like number of people, household size, that's going to be numeric. But other variables, categorical variables like gender, where you have assigned numbers to words, then you can also make them numeric and specify the values under the values column. The next is the comma. And basically this is also numeric, just that for every three zeros from the right hand side, you're going to have a comma. The way that we write numbers, for example, currencies. In other countries, instead of using the comma to separate zeros or numbers, they actually use dots. And that's what you have here, the dot type. It's also a numeric type, just that for every three digits from the right hand side, you get a dot instead of a comma. And in most cases, the comma will now be used as a decimal symbol. Then we have scientific notation, which is simply a numeric variable whose values are displayed with an embedded E and a signed power of 10 exponent. So for example, you can have something like 5.634 E minus five, which actually means 0 0.00005634. Now, you might not really be using this now and again because it's mostly used for numbers that are extremely small. You might not be dealing with this one unless if you're going to be dealing with pure sciences. Next, we have the date type, which as the name suggests is for dates. And then you have the dollar type, which as the name suggests is for dollars, that is the currency dollar. And then you have the option custom currency. The custom currency, can actually be set under the edit menu. So if you have certain currencies that you're going to be using the most, you can actually set them under the edit menu. And then when you select custom currency, you will be able to select the custom currency that you want. It's actually just as simple as setting the prefix of the currency. For example, in my case in Malawi, that's MWK or Malawi Kwacha. The next one is string and string is literally just text. So if the variable is going to be typed in as text, for example, descriptions, then you're going to select string. And finally, 
we have restricted numeric. This is a variable whose values are going to be integers, but you want to keep the leading zeros. If you pull up your calculator now and type 001, by default, the calculator will ignore the first two zeros. So if you want to maintain the zeros in SPSS, when you're typing, you're going to select restricted numeric. All right, so those are the different types of variables that we have. Now, Q1, remember this is case ID, and we're actually going to have this as a number, so I'm just going to pick numeric. Now, you notice that on the same dialog box, you actually do have the width and decimal places, which are characteristics that I also find right here, as you can see. So they are actually the same. So let me just expand them before I go. The width is the maximum number of characters that you'd like to allow on that column. So that is how many characters maximum can be typed in that column. So for a numeric, if we say eight characters, it means that you're going to go to the tens of millions. Now, if you want to go further than that, then you have to increase the width here to include more number of characters. The decimal places is, as the name suggests, how many decimals do you want to show? By default, it's two. Now, if you don't want any decimals, then you're going to put zero here. So in my case, case IDs, we're not going to have any decimals. So I'm just gonna delete this and type zero, and that's it, then I can click okay. So in this way, it means I'm done with the width and the decimals. And why haven't we edited the width? I think the width is fine. This is the, ma the maximum is eight characters. I don't necessarily need to limit this to maybe two or three. If this allows the values that I'm going to be typing, that's perfectly okay. The next thing is the label. Now the label, the next thing is a label. So now the label is a display name of the variable. So when we do analysis, when we have the output, we don't want the output to show Q1 because we're going to present this information to other people. By saying Q1, people will not understand what Q1 is as a variable. So it's better to actually type the whole text, which is the name of the variable itself. Now the label actually allows you to type anything else here. So it actually accepts things like spaces or symbols and so on. So in other words, I can actually type case space ID and that is actually going to be allowed. Moving on, we have the values. The values are now a list of valid options for the variable. So for example, if we have a multiple choice variable like gender, where you have one for male and two for female, you must specify here what one and two means. So what we do is we click there and click the button and then specify here. We're going to show an example when we get to the variable gender or any other variables that require the values. Next, we have missing. You may define values as special missing values. For example, let's say you want to distinguish between data that are missing because a respondent refused to answer. So you might use something like 88 to show that that's refused to answer. And maybe you want that data that are missing because the question did not apply to that respondent. Uh, for example, you want to show 99 as not applicable. So data values that are specified as user missing are going to be flagged for special treatment and will be excluded from most calculations. So for example here, let's say that you asked a question, are you married? Now others will be married and others will say they are not married, but you might have respondents who don't have to respond to that question, for example, underage kids. So when you're calculating the percentage of people who are married, you don't want to include those that did not respond because the question was not applicable to them because it might mean something quite different. So you want the percentage to only be out of those people who said yes, they're married or no, they're not married and not ones that are not applicable. So in this case, for the cases where the question was not applicable, then under missing, you have to click the button and select that you have discrete missing values. So let's say that you are using 99 as not applicable, then you would type 99 here to show that when SPSS finds this value in the data, then that value should not be included in calculations. Now we're not going to have that for Q1, so I'm just gonna go ahead and close this. The next one is number of columns. And number of columns is just how wide the column for that variable is going to be. So for example, if I go to the data view and then I click in between of two columns like this, the way we do in Excel and click and drag out, 
when I go back to variable view, you notice that the number of columns is now 27. If I go back and make this a bit smaller, in the variable view, you notice that now it's 12. So what that means is when you type here, you can actually type 12 characters that will show up here. So this has nothing to do with your data. It's literally just about how the data is going to be viewed in the data view. So in most cases, we don't change anything there. And that goes the same with the alignment. The alignment, again, is not very important. It's just how the data will be aligned in the column for that variable. Do you want it to be on the left side, on the right side, or at the center? It's literally just about aesthetics. And then we have measurement labels. If you remember, we talked about measurement labels and we distinguish between nominal, scale, and ordinal variables. If you don't remember this, please go back to the lesson where we're talking about measurement levels and understand the measurement levels before you come here because we're going to be using them when we are creating variables. In my case here, variable Q1 is IDs. It's not a quantity. So it's basically just names. We simply want to name the cases by giving them numbers. So that is going to be a nominal variable. And finally, we have the row. And the reason we have the row is because some dialog boxes in SPSS support predefined rows that can be used to pre-select variables for analysis. So when you're running analysis and you have defined rows already, then SPSS is going to automatically move the variables to their corresponding boxes depending on the row that you have specified. So the rows that we have here are, for example, input, which is the same as an independent variable. An independent variable is a variable that we think is affecting another variable. And then we have target, which is the same as a dependent variable. And a dependent variable is the effect or the variable that we think is being affected by another variable. And then we have both, that is the variable could either be input or target, and then we have none, which means that the variable could be neither independent variable nor dependent variable. Or we could want to use the variable to partition the data for other purposes, for example, for training, for testing and validation. Or you might want to use that variable to do comparisons across your data by using the split command. So those are the characteristics of variables. Now, in the next lesson, we're going to go through the rest of the variables and defining them appropriately. Now, let's move on with the rest of the variables that we have. So the next variable is Q2, which is name of respondent. So once again, I'm just gonna type here Q2, and then I press the tab key, and by default, the type says numeric. However, this is name of respondent, so we're going to be typing text, or the names of the people in text. So we have to click where it says numeric to review that button and then we click the button now for text we need to use string and you can see here it actually says characters but it's actually the same as width so we have to think about the longest name how many characters would the longest name be i have seen that 50 characters is actually enough so i'm just going to type 50 like so and click ok the next thing i would do is now specify the decimals but already you can see that the decimals is zero and that is because here, the variable is a string variable. So for text, we don't have any decimal places. The next thing is a label, of course. Remember, the label is the display name of the variable. So here, I'm going to type name of respondent, like so. And I press the tab key to go to the values. We don't have the values for this variable. So I'm just going to go straight away to the measurement label because we don't have any missing values for name of respondent, we're going to have names for every record in the data set. And remember, columns and alignment are not very important, but now let's set the measurement label. Now, obviously, this is a name, so already this is going to be a nominal variable. Now, in terms of the row, I'm just going to leave it as default. As a matter of fact, this is what we are going to be using for every one of the variables, we're not going to be setting the row because it's not very important at this point. Let's go to the next one, which is Q3. We'll type Q3 and press the tab key. And now the type here by default says numeric. 
And the variable here is age of respondent, so that's certainly numeric. So I'll leave it as the default. The width is eight, that's fine. And we have two decimal places. If you're going to have decimal places for the variable age, then you can go ahead and type there. But I'm not going to have any decimal, so I'm just going to reduce this to zero. And then the label is age of respondent. All right, the next thing is the values. So this is not a multiple choice question, so we don't need to set the values. Now, in the missing, if we have a value that actually stands for missing, so for example, if certain people did not tell us their age and we had to type something else to stand for missing, then we will set it here. So let's say that for every person who said they will not tell us their age, we were recording negative nine, then what we have to do is click where there's none for that variable and click the button. And where we have missing values, we click on discrete missing values. And here we are going to say minus nine to mean missing. And then we click OK. So for every case where they were not giving us the age, we would type minus nine. And when we're calculating things like the averages for that variable, that minus nine is not going to be factored in because it's a missing value. Columns and alignment are not necessary, but let's talk about the measurement label. This is age of respondent, and it's obviously a continuous variable or a quantitative variable as we had already been discussing. So here I'm going to pick that it's a scale variable. The next thing is a variable Q4. So I'll type there Q4 and press tab. And by default, the variable type is numeric. The variable that we have here is sex of respondent, now, we could make it text so that we are typing male or female, but when you're entering data directly into SPSS, you can make spelling mistakes. Now, when you make a spelling mistake and you analyze your data, all those spellings will actually show up as separate values. So to avoid that, that's why we enter numeric values instead. So it's easy to type one or two as compared to typing the word male or the word female. So we're just going to make this numeric and then we'll set the values accordingly. The width is fine. Uh, we're not going to have any decimals because we just have two values, one and two. And the label is supposed to be sex of respondent like that. In a tab key, so on the values here, we now have to click where it says none and then click on the button like so. Then we're going to set the values. So here the value one, the label is male and you click the add button and then you have two whose label is female and then you click the add button again and then you click OK. So now we have set the values. Next up, if there are people who said they're not going to tell you their sex, which I'm very sure that you'll not really be asking this as a question, you just notice an actual recording. But if there are, then you would set the values that are standing for the missing values. But we don't have any, so we jump missing columns and alignment, and we'll talk about measurement label. The default so far is nominal, and if you've remembered the discussion on measurement labels, it certainly is a nominal variable. Finally, we have Q5. Q5 is education level attained. And just like sex of respondent, we actually have values and their labels. So we're going to make this numeric so that when you're entering data, we're entering the numbers one, two, three, or four, but we are going to set the values to show SPSS what those numbers mean. So here we don't have decimals because we only have one, two, three, and four as the values. And the label is going to be education label attained. Then in the values, we click where it says none, and then we click the button. Now under value, we have one, which stands for none, and then we press, and then we click add. Then we have two, this time we can use the tab key and then type primary, and we can use the enter key to add it. So we can now go back to say three, that's the value, tab key. This is standing for secondary. And again, we can just press the enter key. And finally, there is four, tab key, and this is tertiary and then we press the enter key again to add that set. And once that is done, we click OK. That's perfect. So now I'm going to jump missing columns and alignment again, and we'll go to measurement label. 
Now, if you take a look at this variable, the values are ranging from one all the way to four. And if you take a look at the education levels, these are levels of education. So the, as the numbers are going up, the education level is actually also going up. So although this is a text variable, a categorical variable, but we have some kind of order going on. If you remember on our lesson on measurement levels, we call this an ordinal variable. So now we have set up all the variables. Let's go ahead and save our data set. You can do that by just clicking this big save icon and then just go ahead and give it a name. I'm just going to call this data and then we just click save. That's perfect. So now in the next lesson, we'll talk about how to enter data in SPSS. Now that we have created our variables, it's now time to enter data. So what we do here to enter data is to switch to the data view. Now you notice on the data view that the variables are right here at the top. We have Q1 all the way to Q5. And when you move your mouse over the variable, it actually shows all the details of the variable. So we have the name, the label, the type, and of course the measurement. So let's go ahead and type a record. I have actually provided you with a table of the data that we are using here for practice. So just go ahead and practice with that data. So Q1, which is a case ID, is one. And what I normally do is once I type that, I use the tab key to maneuver to the next column. So the next is a name, which is Peter, then tab key. The next is the age 20, tab key. The next is sex of respondent. And remember, we have one for male and two for female. So in this case, that's one. And the next is education level attained, which is primary. And if you remember on the list, that is two. And when you press the tab key, it actually takes you in the next row in the first column. That is really neat and fast. However, you obviously might make mistakes here without realizing that you have entered the wrong data especially if you don't really see what the one or what the two means. So what you do now is that on the shortcut toolbar, you go ahead and click this button here that says value labels. So once you click that button, instead of showing the values, it's actually showing the labels. So where there was one, there's male, and where there's two, there's actually a primary in the question Q5. So that's going to make it easy for us when we are typing the data, but also it's going to make it easy for us to understand the data just in a snapshot by looking at it. So the next one is two, and this person is John. Tab key, the age is 25, this person is male, and you can actually notice that now, instead of typing one, I'm actually typing male, and once I start typing, when I type the letter M, it actually knows that I'm typing male, so I can just press enter to select male, and use my arrows to go to the next one where I can actually type primary school. But now I can just type two to mean primary school and tab key and it's going to show me that that's primary. Let's just enter the third one. Three, the name is Martha. The age, which is Q3, is 32. The gender is female, so that is going to be two. And education level attained, which is Q5, is tertiary, which is four, and I can tab key and that is perfect. So now go ahead and type the rest of the table just for you to practice. Now, in many cases, you're not necessarily going to be typing data directly into SPSS. You might actually have another program where you are collecting your data and that data is going to be exported into a format, for example, Microsoft Excel. So we have a Microsoft Excel file right now, as you can see, and it has some fictional nutrition data for kids. And we have these variables which have been described in the key worksheet here. So when I switch to the key worksheet, you can actually see that HMI stands for household monthly income, S is for sex, PHE is for parents, highest education, and so on. And that's the names of the variables that we have here at the top. So what we want to do is we want to get this data into SPSS. Now, the first thing that you need to do is to close the data set in Microsoft Excel because once you have this open, when you try to import the data, you're actually going to have problems. And while I'm there, I need to also mention that you need to make sure that the data set is not in read-only mode. This actually happens when you have downloaded some data set from the internet. What I recommend is if you have downloaded a Microsoft Excel data set from the internet, is you must open it first, 
and Excel is going to show you a message asking you if you want to be able to edit that worksheet. Once you allow it, then you can save it and close it. So let's go ahead and close this. Now we are in SPSS and let's go ahead and actually import the data. Now to import the data, if you're using the latest SPSS version like the one I'm using, just go to file, import data, then select the type of data that you have here. If it's an Excel file, like in my case, I'll select Excel. If you're using a CSV file, then you select CSV. You even have other options down here. So you're just gonna go ahead and click Excel and that is going to take you to this dialog box. If you're not using the latest version of SPSS, let me actually close this. Then what you need to do is go to file, open and data. That is going to take you to this dialog box. And the only difference with the last one is that where it says files of type, you just need to click the drop down and select Excel. That's the only difference. So now the next thing is you have to go ahead and click the drop down here where it says look in and navigate to the folder where you have the data set. I'm already in the folder where I have the data set, which is this nutritional data fictional here. So I'll go ahead and select it and click open. So now you're going to end up with this dialog box that says we are trying to read the Excel file on this path here. And now it says, which worksheet are you trying to import? If I click the drop down, you notice that those two worksheets have been listed here. The other one that has data is this one here. And then we have the one with the key. Obviously we want to import the data one. So I'll click that. And you have these options here that says you want to read the variable names from the first row of data. Yes, in most cases, the first row of data in Excel is going to be the variable names. And that's what we want to use. The second one says percentage of values that determine data type. That's not very important, but the whole idea of that is if you have mixed types of data in the column, then what percentage of data is going to determine what type of data is going to be assigned by SPSS? The default is okay. The next one is to ignore hidden rows and columns. If you have hidden rows and columns from Microsoft Excel and you don't want to ignore them, then you can uncheck this option. The next one pertains to data cleaning. If you have text variables or string variables where you have leadings or trailing spaces, then you might want to clean them up by checking these two options. But I am okay here, so I can just go ahead and click okay. Now you notice that SPSS has opened a new data editor window. If I move this around, you can see that the other one we started with is still there. So I'll maximize this. Now on this, we have the variables, but remember we are still using the codes. So it's HMI, PHE, CBW, and so on. So the next step you will do after you have done this is probably you want to save it. So I'm actually going to go ahead and save this data set and I'm going to call it nutrition data. Then I go ahead and click save. The next step is to now switch the variable view and clean up the variables. In most cases, what you're looking for are the labels, the values, and the measurement labels. In some cases, you might want to look at the decimals. So for example, if I switch the data view, you notice that the child birth weight, you have a lot of zeros, and that is coming out because of the number of decimals that we have here, which is 15. So let's go through each variable one by one. The ID is fine, the width is okay, the decimals are okay, but on the label, I'm just going to say that's case ID. We don't have any values or missing or anything else, but we must specify the correct measurement label. From the previous two lessons, you notice that the ID is simply a nominal variable. So I'll click the drop down and select nominal variable. The next variable is household monthly income. I know this because I looked at the key worksheet from the data set. So household monthly income, and that's what is going to be here as the label. It's not a multiple choice question, so we don't have any values, we don't have any missing. I'll just go right away to the measurement level. As household monthly income is a quantitative variable, it's actually going to be a scale variable here. The next one, PHE, that's parents' highest education. 
So here we're going to type parents highest education. And now we have to specify the values because this is actually a categorical variable. And we have values one up to four, which are standing for the levels of education. So what I would do is I click where it says none, and then I go ahead and click the button. So one is none, then I press enter. Two is for primary, press enter. Three is for secondary. And finally, we have four, which is for tertiary. We press enter, and then we click OK. Here, we have to specify the correct measurement level. So remember, parents' high education, these are education levels. We have some order on the categories there. So we have to click the drop down and select that that's an ordinal variable. The next one is child birth weight, and we're measuring child birth weight in kilograms. We have 15 decimal places here, which is too much. So I'm actually going to edit that to just two. And in the label, I'm actually going to type child birth weight. That's fine. That's fine. Now we don't have values. This is actually a continuous variable. So I'm just gonna go ahead straight away to look at the measurement level. Here it says a scale variable, which is correct. So I'm just going to leave it as is. Let's go to the next one, which is sex. Again, everything is okay, except we have to start on the label. So the label is sex of child. And here on the values, since we have values one for male and two for female, we have to set those up. So I click where it says none and click the button. Once again, one, that's for male, and two, which is for female, and we press enter and click OK. On the measurement level, this has already been specified as nominal, which is OK, so we can go to the next one. The next variable is child age in months. So the first thing I need to do is type the, is type the label. That's perfect. Again, that's a continuous variable. So we don't have any values. And when you go to the measurement level, it's scale, and that's perfectly fine. And finally, we have base weight class, and we only have two values for this. We have underweight and we have normal. So the first thing on the label, let's type birth weight class. On the values, we'll click where it says none and we click the button. So one is for underweight. And two is for normal. Then I'll go ahead and click add and then I'll click OK. And this has already been assigned nicely as a nominal variable as well. All right, so let's go ahead and switch the data view and see how this data looks like now. And now you can see that everything is being nicely displayed here. Everything has been cleaned up. So we can go ahead and click the save button to save the changes we have made. And we are actually ready for data analysis. So in the next section, we are actually going to start up to do analysis using descriptive statistics. A few lessons back, I introduced you to descriptive statistics which is a branch of statistics that helps us to summarize our data in a more meaningful way. And we can also use it to actually explore some relationships between variables in our sample. Now, sometimes we actually even use descriptive statistics to explore errors in our data before we can conduct some advanced statistical analysis or inferential statistics. Now, to select the appropriate type of analysis to conduct, we're gonna be using measurement labels. So remember, we talked about measurement levels before. Now, due to the nature of categorical variables in that we cannot do any mathematical computation on them, the best way that we can summarize them is through using frequencies. Frequencies are simply counts of the different data values that we have on the variable. So for example, here we have the variable sex where we have males and females, how many females there were and how many males there were. Now, these frequencies or counts can also be represented as percentages. Now, let's take a look at how we can calculate frequencies for the variable sex. So in SPSS, what we do is we actually go and click on the Analyze menu, and then we go to Descriptive Statistics, then we select Frequencies. 
this is a dialog box that is going to show up. And you can see that on the left hand side, we have all the variables that we have in the data set. And on the right hand side, we have this empty box. And what we need to do now to select the variable that we want to use for analysis is we have to drag and drop the variable for analysis and put it on the right hand side. So just click and drag and drop it over on the box on the right hand side. And believe you me, this is the only thing you need to do to analyze a categorical variable. I'll just go ahead and click OK. Now you notice that you have this window here, which is the viewer window, the output viewer window. And it actually shows us the output of the analysis that we have just conducted. Let's take a look at what this output is talking about. So the first thing is the statistics box, which is basically showing us the N. Now the N is basically the number of cases that we have in the data set. So the N valid means the total number of cases that have valid value, or that is the number of cases where we have none missing information on that column. So we have 413 people who actually gave us the agenda. Missing is now the number of cases that have missing values and we have none in the data set. That's perfect. The next table is going to show us now the frequencies. The frequency column is showing us the total number of cases who responded. So now we know that 215 were males and 198 were females for a total of 413. So the percent column is the percentage out of the total number of cases that we have in the data set. We have 413 total number of cases. So we have 52.1% out of those 413 being males and 47.9% out of the total of 413 being females. Now, mind you, this percentage is out of all the people in the data set. So even if you have other people who did not respond to this question, this percentage is going to be out of the total number, which actually includes those people who did not respond to the question. Valid percent, on the other hand, is the percentage out of the total number of cases who actually responded to that question that is valid or non-missing values. So if you do have missing values here, then the valid percent is going to be different because the valid percent does not count those people who did not respond to the question. And actually, this is the best percentage for you to report. So because we don't have any missing values, then you can actually see that the values that we have here are exactly the same. Finally, we have the cumulative percentage. The cumulative percent is the total percentage when you add with the percentage of the previous category in the table on that row. So on the first row here, the percentage is 52.1% for males, which is exactly the percentage we have here. But when we take 52.1% and add it over to 47.9%, we get 100%. Now, there are certain other things that you can add on to the frequency table. For example, you can even turn on some charts. So let's go back and take a look at those things. So I'll minimize this, go back to the main window, and go to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, and go back to Frequencies. You will notice that SPSS actually remembers what we did previously, which is we have the variable sex of child here. But now, let's go ahead and take a look at the Statistics tab. In the Statistics box, you can actually see that we have several statistics here, for example, the mean, the median, the mode which are called central tendency. We're going to talk about this when we're actually talking about how to summarize continuous variables. Out of the statistics that we have here, only the mode applies to categorical variables, but it doesn't necessarily make very good sense. That's why I'm not going to do anything here. And everything that we have under dispersion, and of course everything here, we're actually going to need those when we are summarizing continuous variables. So for now, let's just close this because we don't have anything that we can do here. Next, we have charts. Let's click that. Under the charts, first we have none. That is the default option. That is, it's not going to produce any charts. But you can also produce bar charts and pie charts or histograms. If you are summarizing categorical variables, like our case here for sex of child, then we can turn on bar charts or pie charts. If you're summarizing a continuous variable, 
then you can use a histogram. I'm actually just going to use the bar chart. And now you have the choice for frequencies or percentages to be presented on your y-axis. Now, what I do in most cases is that if you have a lot of cases in the data set, then using percentages is going to be much better because when you have bigger numbers, percentages are easier to compare. But if you have cases that are below 100, then I think using percentages is like cheating because percent is actually short for per 100. So if your cases are not 100, then saying percent is actually like you are cheating. So then I actually recommend that you should turn on frequencies instead of percentages. I do have 413 cases. I think that's enough for me to actually use percentages. So I'll click on percentages and click continue. You can also turn on to create APA style tables, which is a feature that has just been added in this version of SPSS. For now, I'm just gonna go ahead and click OK. And you notice that we still have the first two tables, but apart from that, let me actually go ahead and maximize this. We also do have this chart, which we can actually use to accompany whatever discussion we are writing based on the output that we have here. Now, let's just do one more example. So I'm just going to go ahead and minimize this. This time, I want to summarize the parent's highest education. It has several categories, more than two, so I think it's going to be a little bit interesting as well. Let's go back to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, then Frequencies. So now, if you want to summarize a single variable, I can just click this, drag it, and drop it back into the box. And then I'll take parents highest education and drop it on the right hand side here. Suffice to say, you can actually summarize many variables at once. So if you want to summarize many variables, just drag the other variable and drop it on the right hand side. For example, I could take birth weight class and drop it on the right hand side without a problem. Now, the settings that we had before actually do apply here. So when I go to charts, you actually see the bar charts is still selected here. I, I'll click continue. If you want to reset everything, you can actually click the reset button, which will reset everything to default. And I would have to bring the variable to the right hand side again and choose the options that I want to turn on. This is fine for me. So I'll just go ahead and click OK. And I'll maximize this. And once more, you can actually see that we have this table of statistics, which now has two variables. We have the first frequency table, which is showing us parents' highest education. And from here, we can see that 47 didn't go to school, while 161 at least went to primary school, 156 went to secondary school, and 49 went to tertiary school. And we have the corresponding percentages, value percentages, and cumulative percentages. You notice that for cumulative percentages, 11.4% said that they did not go to any school. And when you combine that to the next one, which is primary school, you get 50.4%. So basically we can say that 50.4% is a combined percentage for both non and primary school. And it actually increases going up, up to 100% on the level of tertiary school. For an ordinal variable like this one, it's actually interesting to look at the cumulative percentages. Now, in the end, you actually do have two different charts. You have the first one, which is parents' highest education as you can see here. And now when you go to the next one, you have birth weight class, where you're looking at those that are underweight and those that are normal. And you notice right away that I definitely have made a mistake here when I was labeling this, because actually I need to have more normal than underweight based on the understanding of my sample. So because of that, I need to go back to the data set and look at the birth weight class. You notice here that we have all normal here, but if you take a look at the chart birth weight here, 1.89 kilograms is not supposed to be normal. It means that when I was recording the values, I did not assign them correctly. So I have to go back to variable view under base weight class and take a look at the values under here. I'll click the button to take a look at what I did. So here I have one for underweight and two for normal, and it's actually supposed to be the other way around, whereby one is supposed to be normal and two is supposed to be underweight. So I'll click on this one and remove it and click this one again and remove it. So now I have to type that one is for normal and I'll click add. And now two is supposed to be for underweight and then I'll click add and then I'll click okay. So now let's go back and do that analysis once again. So I'll go back to analyze, 
descriptive statistics and frequencies, everything is exactly the way it was. So I just go ahead and click OK. So now when I expand that and scroll down, you notice that we have more normal children than underweight children. And if I minimize this and go to the data view, you actually notice that, yeah, that actually makes sense because all these kids that are below three kilograms of child base weight must be underweight as compared to the ones that are above three kilograms. So you can see how descriptive statistics is extremely important, not only to summarize your data, but also to look at some errors that you might have made. In the next lesson, we are now going to look at how you can interpret the data and also how you can present it in your reports. Now let's take a look at how you're going to present this information in your thesis, in a dissertation or in your report. So you can either present the frequencies as statements and we have here the templates of statements that you can use. For example, here you can throw in the percentages of respondents in our sample were male, while you throw in the percentage of female, or you can say the sample consisted of, and then you put the percentage male and percentage female respondents. And then in brackets, you can actually say the total N. And, or you can say the sample consisted of, and then you put the number here and the percentage there, male, and then another number here and a percentage there, female respondents, and put an end. So I think this one has more information, so let's use that as an example. So in our, in our sample here, we actually have, uh, if you look at sex of child, we have 215 males and 198 females. So we can say the sample consisted of, and then we are going to have the number 215 then in brackets, we're going to say 52.1%. Then we're going to close the bracket, male. And then we go to the female. So the number is 198. So 198. In brackets, that's 47.9%. And close the bracket, female. So instead of respondents, we'll just have children. And in brackets, we're going to have N equals, so the total, which is the N valid at the top, is 413. And then we close the bracket and full stop. So this is perfectly fine. Now, another way you can present this is by using a table. So in APA, you can only use a table if you're going to have at least two rows or more than two rows. So in this case, we do have two rows. So this is a template of a table that you can use. So in APA, this is the style you have to use. You only need to have borders at the top and the border to separate the header of the table and the rest and another border at the bottom, that's all. So here, the frequency for males, we have 215, while the frequency for females, we have 198. And then the percentage for males, is 52.1 and we actually have to throw in the percent symbol there and finally for the percentage for females is 47.9 percent so this is a perfect table you can literally just take this and throw it in your report and it's gonna suffice but of course you have to label this so we can say here let's say that this this was table one so we'll say table one full stop and there we now have to put what this table is about. So we can say table of frequencies for gender. So for this statement, I'm just gonna select it and remove the board and just make it italics. So if you're using APA format, this is how it's going to look like. So unlike categorical variables, which we have just seen in the frequencies lesson, Continuous variables normally have numerous discrete values. So for example, if you have 400 respondents to tell you their monthly income, you might end up having over 100 different values of monthly income, like is the case with our variable household monthly income right here. Creating a table of frequencies with over 100 rows defeats the whole purpose of data analysis, which is to communicate a story through your data with minimum numbers as possible. Actually. Let me go ahead and show you how that is going to look like. So I go to analyze, descriptive statistics, then I go to frequencies. 
okay, I have some variables here. So I'll just click reset button here at the bottom. And then we'll grab the household monthly income and then I'll click okay. Now take a look at this. We have a really huge table all the way from here to there. Now, if we take this and throw it in our report, obviously it defeats the whole paper. So everyone is gonna be like, what kind of summary is this? Well, so now how best can we summarize that? So the goal of descriptive statistics for continuous variables or scale variables in SPSS is to describe the data by a single meaningful value. We want to be able to provide one value that when everybody sees it, should have at least an understanding of how the data is. Should at least have an understanding of the structure of the data. So one of the best ways in which we can describe continuous data is by describing the central point of the data set. The premise behind this is that all naturally occurring phenomena usually have the most scores around the number at the middle of the values. The number at the middle is the typical value in the distribution. So we assume that the majority of the data must be around that figure at the middle. Now, there are several numbers that can be used to describe the central point of your data set. They are all called measures of central tendency. Sometimes they're just called averages. And we have the mean, the median, and the mod. The mean is the number that we get when we add all the values together and then divide that by the number of individual values that we have. The median, on the other hand, is the value at exact central point of the data when we arrange the data from the lowest to the highest. And the mod is the most frequently occurring value in the distribution. So let's see how we can get all these values. So I'm going to minimize the output. We'll go to analyze descriptive statistics. As a matter of fact, we can still go back to frequencies. And remember, this actually remembers what it did. So we have household monthly income here. So let's go to the statistics button because this is where we can get all those statistics. So as you can see here, we have the mean, median, and mod. So let's just turn this on for now and press continue. Now the next thing that we need to do is to remove display frequency tables. Remember, this is what's giving us a very big table that doesn't make any sense. So I'll uncheck that and then we'll go ahead and click OK. So let's maximize this. So now you can see that we have this table of statistics, which has the same things, the valid and the missing, but we now have three more items. Let's take a look at those three more items. The first one is the mean. And if you remember, we said that the mean is the value that we're gonna get if we add all the values that we have for household monthly income and then divide by 413, which is the number of cases that we have in the data set. So this is our typical value. The median, like I said, is the value that is at exact middle of the data when we arrange it from the lowest to the highest which as you can see is 180. So the mod is the most frequently occurring value in that column. But now in certain cases, you might actually end up having more than one frequently occurring values as is the case right now. You can see the note that we have here. It says multiple modes exist and the lowest value is the one that has been shown. Now, what does this mean? If we go by the mean, the typical household in the data set ends around $203.39. If you go by the median, the typical household in the data set ends $180.39. But if we want to use the mode, then the typical household in the data set ends $90 per month. Now the question is, between the three, which one should we report? So the mean is the most inclusive of the three. And the reason for that is it includes all values of the data set in the calculation. Remember, we have to add everything and divide by how many numbers we have in the data set. This is why the mean is the most preferred in most cases. However, it is easily influenced by outliers. Outliers are values that are extremely low or extremely higher than the majority of the data set. The mean is best used when the data doesn't have any outliers. But if you have outliers, 
then it's going to move the mean a lot. So in our case, for example, we have the minimum to be $70 and the maximum is $490. Now imagine what would happen if we had someone who actually gets $1 million. That is going to change everything because when we add $1 million to the rest and divide by 413, the value that we are going to get is going to be higher than most of the scores that we have here. So in other ways, it's going to be way higher than the majority of the scores or the typical of the scores. By definition of the mean, which should be the typical value in there, it's actually not going to be representative enough. However, the median is never influenced by outliers. So the median is best used when the data has a lot of outliers, then you can use the median because it's going to be very representative. So whether you have extremely high values or you have extremely low values, that's not a problem. The number at the middle is still going to be the same. However, the median is not very inclusive because the median is actually an exact value that you have in the data set. Now, the mode is the least used value for central tendency for several reasons. First, you can have multiple modes as we have seen in our example. And if most scores occur with similar frequency, so for example, if most of the scores occur maybe twice, and then you only have one value that occurs three times, then that value is going to be said to be the mode, even though it occurs one more time than the rest of the values that we have in the data set. So it's not really very dependable. That's why most times people will either choose the mean or will choose the median. In the previous lesson, we saw how we can describe our data by pointing at the central point of the data set called the central tendency. Now, the central point of the data alone may not paint the full picture of the data. We also need to know how the data varies across a distribution. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I tell you that the average number of eggs I have eaten in 10 days is two. It could mean that I ate two eggs every single day for 10 days. Or it could also mean that I ate 20 eggs in a single day and no egg in nine days. But then these two scenarios are very different. If I go to my doctor, the second example where I ate 20 eggs in a single day might raise an alarm but not the one where I ate two eggs per day for 10 days. So apart from mentioning the central point of the data, we also need to show how the values actually vary from each other. There are several measures that can be used to show the dispersion or the variability of the data. The most common and useful ones, we have the range, which is basically just the maximum value subtracted by the minimum value and the standard deviation, which is the average of the distances between each value and the mean. Let's take a look at some example. We're still going to use the same example for household monthly income. So I'll go ahead and minimize this. Then we go to analyze, descriptive statistics, frequencies. We still have the household monthly income here. So I can just go back to statistics button. And this time I want to turn on standard deviation minimum, maximum, and range. Then I'll go ahead and click continue, and then I'll click okay. Let's go ahead and expand this. So from the output, we already know the mean, the median, and the mode. But the standard deviation is the average distance between each value in the data and the mean. So we have 413 values. When we calculate the mean, we have $203.39. Now we want to find out the distance between each value in the data set and the mean, which is $203.39. Remember, we think that the mean is a middle point of the data. So now we need to calculate the average of those differences so that we can say that on average, each value is $104.13 away from the mean. If the value of the standard deviation is very high, then we can actually say that we have so many variations in the data. But if it's low, then we can say that we don't have so much variations in the data. The range, like I said, is just the maximum minus the minimum. We have the maximum 490. If we subtract 70, we get the range of 420. 
Now the question is, what does this mean? So remember, theoretically, we are saying that the mean is the central point of the data. Now, we want to see how far on average each data point is from the mean. So what happens is that we subtract every value from the mean and then get the average of the resulting values. So unfortunately, using this method will always result into zero. Now, to solve this, the differences are going to be squared first to get a positive number. Then an average is going to be calculated for those squared differences. Now, finally, we calculate the square root of the average so that the answer can be in the original units of the variable that we are trying to calculate. The answer is the standard deviation, which is simply an average of the differences between each value to the mean. If all values in a data set are exactly the same, for example, if we have a distribution where we have 10 numbers and every number is a two, like in the example that I gave you about eggs, then the standard deviation is zero. Now, a bigger standard deviation in relation to the mean will mean that there are far more variations in the data. Hence, when we report a mean, we must also indicate the standard deviation to tell the reader whether the values that got us to the mean are close together or they are spread further apart using the standard deviation. You can say that the standard deviation is going to tell us how representative the mean is. If the standard deviation is zero, then it means that all the values are the same. In other words, two is indeed exactly the center of the data. But if the standard deviation is very, very high, then we might actually find that the mean is not necessarily the middle point of the data, but at least the reader is going to know that we have a lot of variations in the data. Now, let's take a look at how you can present this in your thesis, dissertation, and on your report. As a statement, we have these two templates here. So you can say the average and you plug in the variable, for example, the average age was, then here you put the value of the mean, and then in bracket, you put standard deviation or SD equals, then you mention the standard deviation here. We also have another template here where you can say the mean and mention the variable of the respondents was, and then you mention the value of the mean, with a standard deviation of, and then you mention the value of the standard deviation. I'm just going to use the first one there. So we're going to say the average household monthly income, that's the name of the variable, was, so in our case here, that's 203.39, so we'll type that, 203.39, and then we put in brackets SD equals so the standard deviation is 104.13, that's to two decimal places, and then we can close the bracket and full stop. Now here, we need to select this SD and put it as italics like that, and that's exactly how you do it. Now, if you have multiple variables, you can actually go ahead and put the table. So what we do is we start by saying here, maybe this is table one, full stop, and down here, we're going to type in the title of this table. But first of all, let's type in our information here. So here, the variable is household monthly income. And the mean that we have is 203.39. And the standard deviation is 104.13. But now, Obviously, this is just one line. It doesn't make sense to put it in a table like this. But I have gone ahead and actually summarized the rest of the variables. So household monthly income, we actually have more variables. So let me just move this somewhere here. So now, the next variable that I have, I'm just going to create another row. So I can say child birth weight. Our average for child birth weight is 2.8, and our standard deviation for child birth weight is 0 0.39. Then we can actually go ahead and do child age in months. The mean for that is 18.67. And our standard deviation is 9.65.
But of course, the child birth weight, maybe we need to include the units, so, and that is in kgs. That is going to help the reader to understand the units that we are using. And here, we need to actually plug in our title. So here we can say, summary statistics. Let's just say of key variables. And we need to select that, remove the board and make it italics. And there we are done. We can actually get this into our dissertation or thesis or report.